now could be less than a month. And um, they're, they're moving these things along much more quickly. But no, no matter what happens with the short sale stuff, I mean, this will probably run its course and there'll be some new thing that will the DRE will be on to, you know, this time last year was all about slow <coughs> modifications. So, you know, it does seem that it's a kind of a cycle. But no matter, the mishandling of earnest money deposits is a continual problem for people. The uh, revision of the residential purchase agreement has helped a little bit here. It's not as easy to make the mistake that people used to make. But you have to be very careful that whatever is represented on that document is exactly what's happening with those funds. If you can uh, have your offers be such that your offer uh, requires that the buyer is going to be the one handling the earnest money and getting it into escrow, that's probably the best scenario. That way you can never be blamed if something goes wrong. If you take that check, you must log that check at the office. That check has a lot of people misunderstand this and they think it only has to be logged if it's actually going to be deposited into the brokerage's trust account. We yes. don't have a trust account. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but even if you don't have a trust account, right. people think, well, then we don't have to we don't have to account for this check because the check's not made out to us. But in fact, the check must be logged. So that is a, such a common violation, you really can't believe it. This happens just all the time. And it's something the department's not willing to overlook. Now this might be a situation, going back to the idea of them being able to write a citation, let's say if somebody did fail to log a check. Right now, the department probably would bring an accusation against that person. And, and that person would get disciplined because it's a violation, there's nothing you, there's no way to talk your way out of it. Um, now if someone made a mistake like that, maybe it would be appropriate that this is the first time problem, they would get a citation, pay a small fine, and be done with it. I think that sounds fair. Um, but the, the more... But you're um, saying that the only way that the state has to handle it today is that your license is suspended. Right. Well, not, not suspended, well, but it, it, there's a variety of things they can do, but at a minimum, they're going to file this thing called an <laughs> accusation against the license. And then there's a range of things that can happen as a result of that accusation from as low as a public reproval, which becomes a public record and shows up on your license, to as much as revoking the license, mm -hmm. depending on how egregious um, the action is. Let's say somebody, you know, every time they get a check, they don't log it, they, they you know, do a few other things. That person could be a target for a revocation. But the point is, if, if you ever look at your license history online or look at the history of anybody else online, you know, at the bottom there's a comment section. And whatever ends up on there doesn't come off again. That just stays there. It doesn't, you know, I don't care how long you have your license. Um, there's no, you know, after 10 years you get forgiveness or something. That just doesn't exist. So I, I think that's very unfair, I, and I, I don't like it. I see it, uh, you know, I've seen people targeted that should never have been targeted by the department, and that's why I'm really pushing for the citation thing. So, um, but to, uh, regarding the uh, earnest money deposits, it, you know, another thing I'll just point out, a photocopy of the check or a fax copy of the check doesn't count as you having that check. And so if you make the representation that you have the check and that it's made out to XYZ escrow and it'll be deposited and you don't really have physical possession of the check, the Department of Real Estate thinks that's a really serious <laughs> violation that you're actually engaging in fraud. And so I, I really caution you to be very, very careful with this issue. This is, um, anytime files are examined by the department, they find problems in this area. And uh, so I, I really like the um, requirement that the buyer just has to wire or, or take themselves to escrow the deposit, and that way you just stay out of it entirely. The uh, next uh, issue that gets people into trouble and I, I'm sure it wouldn't apply to anybody in this room, but um, many of your colleagues have criminal convictions. <laughs> and those convictions can be for a broad array of things. For some reason, uh, real estate licensees like to shoplift. 
<laughs> and uh, the department doesn't like that. <laughs> so they uh, they say, you know, if you shoplift, then how can you be trusted to, you know, go into someone's house, have access to their house when they're not there? And so yes. So, it, and I will share with you that I've represented <coughs> very nice people who shoplifted. They just are having some personal problems. It, it's kind of a, it, instead of being an alcoholic or taking drugs or being promiscuous or something, that's kind of their way of acting out. So, um, you know, I would say if you find yourself, you know, if the work is stressful and, and everything, you know, take care of that in, a, in another way. Maybe you don't want to put yourself in that position. Yeah. So, but I, I also, I, I will also want to explain that people think that only felony convictions will get them into trouble with the department, that the department would be otherwise just would overlook a misdemeanor conviction that that doesn't really count against them, and that's not true. Um, really, any misdemeanor conviction, they have a way of, of arguing that that's connected to your um, function as a licensee, and therefore is what what they call substantially related to the license. And for that reason, they can take an action against you. So, people that get a second DUI, that's considered substantially related. You can expect the department's going to be contacting you and setting up a case um, and of course the, the things that they take you know the very most seriously against people or any crime that would have to do with actual real estate activity and again I mean you'd be surprised how many of your colleagues have convictions from the relate back to the 90s before they had stated income loans there were a lot of agents involved in doctoring W-2s and various other pieces of information about people's income. And then sooner or later, the federal government would find out about this and, you know, again, these people would be charged and uh, convicted of federal crimes. And so, I mean, you would just be surprised how prevalent it really is. Um, the other thing I'll just mention that I expect we're going to be seeing some complaints over to the department that would have to do with cash for keys. And that's when, if you're handling a foreclosed property and the lender wants the people who are there out, they may say, well, we'll pay those people to leave. Agent, here's a check, get them out of there. Well, you need to be very careful that you're not running afoul of any of any tenant uh, laws that are in place in the state. So I think if you have a situation like that, you're gonna wanna consult closely with your broker and probably the the brokerages risk management attorney to find out exactly what is okay in a given situation so that you're not going to get a complaint against you and also that check from the lender again you have to uh, determine is that check a trust fund type check does that check need to be logged and, and that would be a case-by-case -case basis <laughs> Anybody have questions for Mary Work? Okay, then back. In a short sale, if all of the buyer and seller credits and the negotiator's fees are on the HUD one, are we okay? Uh, maybe not. So that's going to be the final <laughs> HUD one. Yes. Yeah, that can be a problem. That can be too late. Oh no, it's on the. I mean, it's on all the HUD ones. Well, and, and has the has is this a uh, is the lender aware of this on their term sheet? Are they aware of it? I, I think that the lender gets that one. No, I'm asking about when the lender uh, produces a term sheet. Oh yeah, um, it's the price that they're willing to Probably, I mean, your question may kind of go beyond what we would want to do here because maybe you have a particular situation where someone needs to sit down and look at the paperwork well, and say, they do their business a certain way, which I think is above board, but I guess we need to understand whether. So I would say that. Well, the thing is, you'll have people say, oh, we are disclosing everything. 
but for example, maybe the information about the payment to the third party negotiator only gets completely disclosed at that final HUD one when it's maybe too late to pull the plug on things or it's, it's not going to get hot. Maybe there's this uh, addendum being used where that piece of paper is not making its way to the lender. So don't, don't rely on a third party to be doing everything they're supposed to do um, and, and be protecting your interests. So, so my thought is if this is someone that maybe a number of people are using and using on an ongoing basis, the actual paperwork that's, that's representative of one of these files needs to be carefully gone through to make sure that there's not some problem with it, something you know that's not uh, actually making its way to the lender that later on everybody who's been involved in this is going to get questioned about. So does that make sense? Well, the negotiator's working with the bank. I'm not working with the bank. The negotiator's working with the bank. So well, the yeah, you, you, I need to know yeah, but you think that that's protecting you, and it's really not. I'm, I'm just wondering how can I start to work with the bank to know that they've seen all the fees. Well, you could you could ask for a complete copy of everything. I mean. I know that that sounds kind of unpleasant and you know maybe you're rocking the boat by doing that but the problem is if this were to become a problem later on for you it would be so big and so unpleasant you would I, I really can't even put you in the shoes of someone that I you know my clients that have gone through this kind of stuff it, I mean it's an awful awful experience and you do not want to you know find yourself uh, in it so it's better to ask the questions now make sure you're protecting yourself and you know, if, if they're not doing things the right way, just you know, walk away from it and, and find a situation where the paperwork is going to be done the right way. Well, that's why we involve them so that they do the right way. Yeah. That's not what no, that's why we involve Mary <laughs> <laughs> because she's got that phone number right well, there, and if there's a question, you can call her and talk to her. <coughs> so that's exactly why we're bringing her in here is she's got the overview on what's going to work and what's not going to work. She uh, works in Manhattan Beach, so we're just fortunate to have her close by. Okay. Yeah, and and I understand that you know you want to feel like you, you're going to someone else who's a professional and they're going to take care of this aspect of things that they specialize in short sale negotiating that they know what to do with the lender. You cannot rely on that. There is really no such thing as a short sale specialist. There's no certification um, or designation offered by the Department of Real Estate, for example. And so people claim that you know they have this ability to do this and, and that they know they have the inside track and all that. Yeah, maybe the inside track of, of you know how to cut corners to make it happen. So So uh, what's the determinant then uh, when you're when you're talking to someone who purports to be that or if you're in a transaction and if you're representing the buyer what it, what's your what's your exposure? Well the, my my position on this is if that listing agent wants to use a third party negotiator, they should be sharing their commission with the third party negotiator. That way there is nothing to, to worry about in terms of does the lender know about the fees being paid or not. There's no, that eliminates that question. So if it's a $1,500 fee, you want to see that that $1,500 fee comes out of the, of the listing commission. side right. commission. Right, then there's no question. What is that buyer's agent? Does that work on the buyer's side too? Well, the buyer, then it's it's nothing to the buyer. It doesn't make any difference. The buyer's agent's going to get the commission that's being offered to them. They're not even involved in it. Yeah. What does the phone call cost when you. <laughs> <laughs> Very works. Uh, hourly well, rate. You know, I, it, I mean, it depends. I mean, I take, you know, uh, short inquiry calls from people and, and I don't charge for that because a lot of times what I'm determining is is this someone that actually should become my client and so we need to discuss what the situation is is there some value I can bring to the situation and then if that's the case then you know I would invite the client to come in and see me and, and you know we would set up my uh, fee arrangement at that point yeah. so are you basically saying that's the way to handle short sales for us to do it directly with the lender ourselves and eliminate Right, right. Right. Or if you if you think that there is somebody who has relationships with various lenders, can help expedite this, make the process smoother. Has you, a license. Yeah, has a license, and you want to work with them on your on your side of the deal. Okay, 
and, and there, you guys are going to split your commission, then you're not going to be questioned about that. But you're saying he has a license for the real estate license. Right, and, and right. He has done a number of 